If we were going down the south to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to the southern part of Germany uh, or France, we would go take off, turn and go down to Reading <coughs> and we'd be 4,000 feet over Reading, Reading Beachy Head and then Beachy Head across to France and onwards on the, on the journey there. Of course, before then we got the doodle bugs and we used to be go out, we was operating, when I was in mid-channel, we, we had to fire a white flare if we saw a doodle bug coming, so the artillery on the shore could open the barrage. The barrage used to run at about between 1,000, 1,500 feet and about 3,500 3, feet. And there was 8,000 guns and they just fired this barrage in this box and the planes always had to fly through it. And when they, when they was hit, they just come bowling over and fire turning over. It was quite exciting. The only trouble was you spend been to under a lot of uh, shrapnel from the guns. <laughs> it away still if he was outside. He could hear it hissing in the water, the shrapnel landing. Uh, it's quite exciting. I mean, one of, one of the landings, uh, uh, you will come to it if you read that, Anzio, you might have heard of that. There was a, a programme on the television recently about Monte Cassino, the, 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 on the mountain. Well, Anzio was a little town at the, at the side of Monte Cassino, the north of Monte Cassino, where the Germans all were. And uh, we did an invasion there to try and get around Monte Cassino. Well, the Germans had two mighty guns on a kind of a railway, two railway trucks, 210 millimetre, if you know anything about guns, flipping great things, and they were backed in a railway tunnel and they came out every so often and blasted off with a few shells and shoved them back in the railway tunnel so it was no good bombing it. <laughs> you couldn't get out of them. Um, once we went out to Beachy Head and uh, the jerrys were coming in and they were dropping red markers at Beachy Head to guide their aircraft in when we were <laughs> We didn't stop to shake hands and discuss the tea. And we had to go from, when we were, well, after we'd done the invasion at Anzio, we had to go out to the merchant ships that were tied up, outside, uh, anchored off, to get stores in from them. Otherwise, they were just being supplied by ducks. Do you know what a duck is? Uh, a duck is a, uh, a six-wheel lorry, but it floats. <laughs> That's why they call it a duck. <laughs> and it could run up the beach on its wheels and take the stuff off and run back into the water and sail off out to a ship. <laughs> Hundreds of the things though. <laughs> and you've got to be the outside intelligence. That means anything happening, like D-Day landings, I had to go behind the German lines for three or four days before D-Day, gathering information. And then if you got a crash call on the, on the wireless, it used to, used to be bearing from either Dover or Goodwin Sands or Dungeness and how many miles. And then if you went to that area, and if you couldn't find them there, you used to search, have to square search them. And during the time I was there, we saved over a thousand men. There was a ship that was struck with a, or near missed with a shell from, from the French coast, and it caught fire. And it was beached under Shakespeare Cliff, but before it was beached, we, we took all the soldiers off, it was Canadian soldiers. There were six boats doing it, and rescued 300 men that day. And you go into the beach and all the crews have to be in the tanks and the engines started and ready to, get ready to go. And then we went in, uh, in radio touch with the beach master, of course, uh, and uh, dropped them on the, on the sand. If you could get to the sand, we got to one place where we stopped about as far from here to, uh, what would I say, the width of this uh, pathway because there was a ridge of sand that nobody knew about in front of the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't go fast enough. <laughs> so we went out again then and took a, a running, <laughs> running bash at it and jumped over it. <laughs> and it was beached under Dover Cliff and it burned for about six weeks. I don't know what it had on when it burned. But it was quite a big ship. We came back one foggy, one foggy night and we didn't realise, but we passed between the ship and the shore. It was high tide. <laughs> but we didn't realise till we saw the ship looming out of it. We got away with it. Like D-Day. 
the D Day landings. Um, now, I had to train up for D Day landings, and I thought, well, I wonder what they're sending me to Scotland for the commando base to do unarmed combat, etc., you know, and things like that. And I found out then because, uh, as, as I said, they sent me a, with two commandos on the shore at uh, just for D Day, at the Gold Beach area, Aramanch area. And the job was, uh, and you'll see in the story, was to gather information about the mines and the beach objects, you know, the because the, the beach was full of crisscross uh, light railway lines with mines on them, little limpet mines and that. And then I had to identify different buildings because it could have been identified from the air with the aerial map I got. Or it just showed you a square and because I had to identify what that was, whether it was ammunition or whether it was tanks or... On the whole, I enjoyed that part of the light of war. I didn't enjoy picking the blokes up when there was legs off and that sort of thing, but I didn't have a lot to do with that, just to... Uh, yeah, I was terrified. You knew you had to do a job. That's what you were there for. So that was foremost in your mind. I mean, I was only 20, but I was an officer in charge of two commandos. But it's a job you had to do. You'd sign on to do this job. And although it was terrifying, and believe me, I was scared all the time. You hear some of these people say, oh, I wasn't frightened, you know, and I mean, I've heard them say, oh, well, they must be cleverer men than me, because I was terrified the whole of the time. Believe me, terrified. You, you, it started as soon as you knew you were on ups in the morning, the, um, how shall I say, you didn't get, turn, De dead frightened, but you apprehensive, and the apprehension went all the time until you got back, and with it, and when you did your air tests and so forth, and then you'd um, the uh, extreme points were taxiing round, setting up, and then taking off, because you knew that if you had any problems, then if you had a wheel burst or a tire, or a, um, and the carriage collapsed, or you had a fire in an engine that you could quite easily not survive from it as well. You got airborne, and once you got airborne, um, 120 knots, miles per hour, uh, you were pretty safe then. You could afford to lose an engine and get away with it, even load it up. You know. uh, but you used to pick quite a few men up here and there. So a liberator come down, when he had We'd had the crash call and we saw him in the distance coming down and he only had one wheel down and as the wheel hit he just flipped over on his back. But uh, we only got one man out of that. He had a broken ankle, he was lucky. Some, sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. The mosquitoes just crashing the channel and all you used to find was bits of plywood floating. No, no chance of surviving it. If the, if the lad tried to land the plane in the water, come down by parachute, that's a lot better chance. We were put ashore off a submarine by dinghy, of course, and then he picked us up a few days later. Uh, it was easy getting ashore, very quiet and easy, easier than I thought it was going to be, actually. But after we'd uh, been on, on the beaches a bit, I mean, uh, we nearly got caught twice, anyhow, I'll tell you that. First time we're looking at this first building and there's a sentry stood there. <laughs> and luckily he was looking that way and we were there, so we nipped round the other side of the building. We found out what we wanted, that it was an ammunition dump. Uh, and then we went to a barracks. We thought it was a barracks and it was a big farmhouse. That's where we spent our first night catnapping, as we call it, you know. One looking out and the other two having a quick nap. Um, then we had to, I had to identify a lake. We said there isn't such a lake. There isn't such a lake in Normandy. Uh, go and find out what it is. And uh, it turned out to be the Germans had flooded fields, field upon field upon field, and they'd stuck stakes in with mines on. So if a paratroop dropped on them, you know, and there's pointed straight, they could kill them in any case. Or if the gliders hit them. 
it would blow up, which it, which they did during the D-Day landings. Killed a lot of uh, troops that way. Uh, and then we had to go up the Aramanch Road to identify something else, and we got caught nearly there by a, a German convoy. <laughs> he cut me around the bend, heavily armed convoy, and we jumped in the ditch quick. And uh, like I said in the story, I don't know to this day why they didn't see us. But I think they were on the way to Cali quick because there was a dummy landing at Cali. What we did, the tugs towed uh, landing barges full of dummy soldiers and dummy guns and dummy tanks. And of course the Germans thought the landing, they all said the landing was going to be there because Hitler was determined that the landing was going to be at Cali because it was the shortest route. But we phoned him, we went the longest route to Normandy, you see. And uh, I think that's what helped a lot in the first 24 hours at Normandy. But of course, as soon as they realised. The funny thing about it is, you know, when we were in, in Normandy, we looked at all the gun emplacements and they wanted a gun in one of them. They want a howitzer or any type of gun in any of them. And yet, they must have been quick during the landing because they really blasted us with heavy gunfire out of those pillboxes. So they must have had them hidden somewhere where we couldn't find them. And I say the second night we nearly, uh, second night we spent in a little copse of bushes and in the morning we found out we were about 50, laid about 50 foot from a German tank and its crew, a big German tiger tank and its crew. <laughs> so we scampered away. Um, and then the, the, the worst part then was getting back on board because we had to signal out to sea and they had to signal back. But like I say in the story, what if a German sentry had been watching? It didn't bear thinking about because they'd have been on to us immediately, you know. But we were lucky. It was a very lucky um, part for us our time because, uh, and I don't know why, the German sentries didn't see a thing. And then you you were apprehensive all the time. You're not so bad if you were, say, flying over the North Sea. You could relax just a little bit at night time. Uh, but as soon as you got, you know, within striking distance of the enemy coast, you were, you, it was apprehensive again because you didn't know whether the Germans were sending fighters out to attack you or whether you'd be attacked when you got over there. My goodness. He was, a, he was a bloke who, nothing he liked better than to get in his flipping gun, gun, and get his gun going, you know. And he's firing away with his gun and there's a merchant ship alongside of him and he swings around like this and shot a shell right through the mast. <laughs> well, we didn't really know what was going on. We, I mean, we, we were out, went out at 10 o'clock at night, the night before, and was, we thought there was been a night raid, which obviously there had been as well. But we weren't called that, and we came back and we had an engine problem. So I said, oh, we'll do it tomorrow. He said, it's Sunday tomorrow, or well, whatever it was, I can't remember what day it was. But he says, you're in now, go straight in the dock, and took the hard back, the whale back off, crane, lift the engine out, and your brand new engine in, back in, and we was back, back on the water again at six in the morning, because <laughs> they wanted everybody there, and we thought, what's going on, like, you know? Anyway. We knew, knew the next morning, but uh, there was quite a lot of activity. But we didn't see any of the actual invasion because it was just too far away. Because we only operated as about as far as, well, Dungeness Point was our bearing point. That was where we used to operate from. 